Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Sunday morning live stream. All right. If you can let me know if you can hear me, if you can let me know if you can hear the music and my voice over the music, that'd be awesome. If you're catching this on the replay, thanks for joining me. It's going to be a super casual and fun uh, melodic session with the Euro Rack today. chat yet, so I'm not 100% sure if we are live today. Go ahead and fire up this iPad and sign into my channel so I can make sure that we are live. that we are live and that I can, you know, chat with anyone who tunes into the stream. We're going to be doing a super casual stream today. I'd like to share a technique uh, that I came up with this week for creating some really beautiful and gorgeous uh, melodic sounds with the Euro Rack. Uh, we're going to just take a moment to get started here as I uh, attempt to boot up another iPad and see if I can't uh, find the stream on my channel uh, because for some reason I'm not able to see uh, there's no chat coming through on um, YouTube on my Mac here that I am streaming from. So just bear with me for a moment. Thank you for your patience. And we'll try to get this sorted make sure that I am actually live today. All right. We've got the Desmodus Versio putting a tiny little bit of reverb in the air behind this. Um, let me just get uh, my Wi-Fi going here. Turn that down just a tiny bit. Oh, I see it's not that, but rather it's that's coming through. Okay, we're just going to let that uh, noise go in the background for just a moment. And, okay. I can't get on YouTube on my iPad either, so let's... Uh, I'm not sure if we are live is the thing, everyone. So thanks for your patience um, as I try to find... Uh, the stream on my channel here. Just play the groove that I've put together for a few more minutes while we get started. All right. There we go. Normally I'm able to just see the chat on the right hand side of the screen, but for some reason it's not really showing today. So Looks like I am live, and there are 12 people watching. So, let me see if I can get in here. All right. Hey, we got Jamie in the chat. We got Fade Man in the chat. We got Andy in the chat. We got Sky Tortoise Fairy Man in the chat. We got Wall in the chat. Hey, thanks for signing in, everyone. Oh, man, I don't know why I can't see the chat over here. That is definitely a bummer, but we're going to just work with that. We've got two cams today. We've got the main cam, and then we've got another cam, which I'll be using to show you guys some of the uh, details on the system. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Let's see here. Good deal. All right. Let me explain a little bit about the setup today. Um, we've got, uh, you know, the Euro Rack, and I've also got the Roland uh, TR-8S 
drum machine uh, connected up today. The re and there's a reason for that. The reason for that, that I'm not uh, getting drums currently um, out of this system, is I've been using and experimenting with a new module, which I'm going to try to show you guys here. It is... Let's see here if I can get the name right here. It's a Circuit Happy is the name of the company. It's Circuit Happy, and the module is called ML2. And it's this gold-colored blinking module down here at the bottom. And what this does, let me see if I can get some of these cables out of the way, is it, is a, it creates its own Wi-Fi network. And it allows me to connect up uh, Ableton Link on my Mac and get completely in sync via Ableton uh, Link to Ableton on the Mac. And so I've been experimenting this week uh, with that module. It's been working really well so far. And so this patch originally had the drums uh, coming from Ableton and uh, the melodics coming out of this system. Now, um, because this device creates its own, sorry about that hum in the background. We'll get rid of that in just a few, um, that little tone there. Um, the reason, um, Let's see here that um, basically the module creates its own uh, Wi-Fi network. And so um, I unsign off of my main Wi-Fi network with the Mac and sign on to the Wi-Fi network of this module. And that's been able to give me a really nice tight sync. And we're going to be getting into that in some really detailed future tutorials. Um, but for today, uh, we're just going to work on this specific concept um, about melodics. And we're going to be focusing in specifically today on this module right here. This is the chord module from Qubit. And it, um, it, ge it can generate, you know, major chords, minor chords, dominant chords, diminished chords, suspended chords, augmented chords. And the neat thing about this module is that it has a bunch of different outputs on the bottom. So I've got like a main output here that will, um, you know, put out the entire chord in one output, all four notes of the chord. And then we have these other outputs on the module, which is the root, the third, um, the fifth, and the seventh. So it puts out the four notes in that chord individually. And that's what we're going to be scoping out today specifically, a way to get those outputs utilized in a more um, creative way. Because currently, when I've been using this module, I've mostly just been taking the mix output so that I can get all of the chords coming, uh, not all of the chords, but the main chord, rather, coming out of just one output. And I'll route that, you know, into reverb or filters as needed. Um, but this technique is um, going to allow us to literally um, take these four notes that are making up the chord and output those four notes um, Sorry about that humming in the background. We're going to get rid of that in just a moment. Bear with me. Um, that's just the way I've got it routed today. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a listen to what I've got here currently. And um, I want you to focus in on the melodic content. Not the drums, not the bass part, but the actual melodic content. And what we're going to hear is that the melodic content is kind of randomly um, evolving and changing and progressing over this groove, but it always stays in key. Let's take a listen to this groove a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, I get that kind of question a lot, uh, dendritic fractals, and the thing is, is that I'm a sound designer for a living, um, and I've pretty much dedicated my life to electronic music and this craft since about 1994. Um, I don't really have a lot of other hobbies, I don't really have a car per se, I'm just a homebody and this is really my main passion. Not having uh, extra hobbies and extra outside interests really, you know, helps to be able to, you know, put your money into the gear. But this is certainly not the price of entry, you know, for, you know, being able to make music. I have a lot of gear because I'm a sound designer, but I also have videos and whatnot that teach about how to make music using just one box or just an iPad, for example. 
one of the things that makes the melodics in this group really, you know, sweet sounding is that we're actually running the melodic sound that we're hearing, the arpeggio and the chord, is coming out of the case here and it's being rounded into the eventide black hole reverb pedal. So we're able to get some really special reverb on this lead sound here. And in a minute, I'm gonna pull all of these cables. And we're gonna patch this up from scratch today, one step at a time, going really slowly and explaining like why I'm doing what I'm doing. So that those of you who might have your own Euro rack system, or those of you who might be using uh, my rack on the iPad, might be able to reconstruct something like this um, in your system. In fact, this is a really neat uh, technique, and I'm kind of pushing myself to try to recreate how we can do this in my rack, so that I can create maybe a specific uh, tutorial for that as well. Excuse me while I just click on the air conditioning. It's starting to, summer's coming and it is getting warm early. Okay, um, a little frustrating that I can't see the chat easily today. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, hey, Current Fantasy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, hey, we got soup in the, soup au jus in the chat. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I really appreciate you being here today. Um, let's see here. Um, I think... Yeah, I think let's just go ahead and start pulling these cables. Um, and what I'm going to attempt to do is to um, pull all of these cables out today that are not um, related to the clock because I've already got that set up working really well. And hopefully we can just reuse that uh, setup today. Let's see here. All right. So I told you we were going to get rid of that little buzz in the background, and we did. So sorry about that for the first, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes of the stream today, everyone. Again, if you're catching this uh, on the replay, thanks for joining me, everyone. It's going to be a super casual stream today. We're going to go through this process uh, nice and slowly, one step at a time. One of the reasons also uh, that I want to get this um, you know, in a stream and get this documented is so that I can go back to this if I need to reference. Uh, how I set this up because this is an awesome technique. Um, again, this is a really useful technique specifically uh, to use with the qubit chord module. But if you don't have that module specifically, this technique could absolutely be done um, in other ways as well. You would just need um, four different oscillators um, that are tuned uh, to make a four note chord. So you would have to tune those manually to the notes um, in a chord and then you would be able to recreate this type of technique that we're going to get into here um, using any um, oscillators. Or if you've got another oscillator, you know, a different chord type of module that puts out uh, more than one tone at a time. That's the key here, is that this module isn't putting out like, um, you know, a square, a triangle, a sine, for instance. It's putting out the same waveform out of all of its outputs, but it's a chord module, polyphonic, you know, so it's putting out four different notes, the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh of the chord. And that's really key here. Normally I would go even slower on removing the cables, um, but I'm trying to go a little bit quickly today for the purposes of the live stream. All right. Now, my main sequencers in the system right now are the black sequencer from, whoops, let me change the camera here, are the black sequencer from Erica Synths, and then over on the left side, I've added the drum sequencer from Erica Synths. And these are really robust and complex sequencers. The nice thing about the black sequencer here is that it actually has um, a 
a jack for MIDI out. So I'm able to plug in adapter and get 5-pin MIDI going um, with this module so that when I press play over here on the black sequencer, it can start, you know, play on any external devices that I've got um, out. And, you know, if you guys have been watching my channel for any amount of time at all, you know that hybrid is really where I'm at. So I built this whole system so that I would have the ability to do stuff just like that. Um, to route audio into the system, to route audio out of the system, to route MIDI in and out of the system um, as well. Okay. I'm just unplugging everything that isn't to do with the actual just clock because we've already got that set up really well and there isn't any point in unplugging my clock today. So bear with me, everyone, and we are almost to the starting point for today's session. All right. Um, okay, this is not part of the clock, so we'll unpatch that. All right, everything else is just part of the clock. And what that means is that, let me just make sure that that's correct still. Yeah, okay, great. Um, no, did I? There we go. Okay, fantastic. So now, when I hit play over here um, on the black sequencer, it's starting play over here on the Erica drum sequencer, and it also starts play over here on the Roland TR-8S drum machine, which we may or may not be using today. Um, okay, uh, sorry, my keyboard's a little buried here. Let me go ahead and get a sip of coffee and check in with the chat, and we will get started with the actual patching today. Okay. I would imagine, while well, that this Qubit chord thing would play absolutely fantastically uh, with the subharmonicon, but I don't have the subharmonicon, so I can't speak from experience. I can only guess at that, but I would guess that would be an amazing pairing. Sold the blue box. Good machine, but needed more ends. Yeah, I, I would always, you know, you always, you, you can never have enough inputs is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. I've been making do uh, with just these 12 tracks so far and not bad. I've been kind of, you know, working my um, process around that to record MIDI to the black sequencers. No, uh, we're not recording. I mean, we could. I, I haven't uh, exper experimented with that yet, um, but we can actually record MIDI into the sequencers from external gear. But all we're doing today um, externally is using um, just the MIDI clock out to get this drum machine started. In the original patch that I had here, I was using, uh, which I explained in the very beginning of the video, uh, I was using drums from Ableton because I'm experimenting uh, with a new module that's allowing me to get Ableton Link in this system, which is starting to become like next level powerful when we can actually sync up um, Ableton Live uh, with this system. But we're not going to be getting into that today, and we may or may not uh, be using the Roland TR-8S drum machine uh, today, but it is here if we want to use it. Um, let me just, I'm not sure why I'm not getting volume anymore out of the, there we go, okay, fantastic. So we still got level on the Roland TR-8S drum machine. This isn't really part of the session today, and I'm just gonna, you know, like, it's not part of the focus, per se. What's the focus today is the beautiful melodics that we're about to create, and I'm super excited about this and to share this with you. Okay, let me uh, switch over here and let's see if I can sort of grab this camera and show you what we're going to be doing first. We're going to be taking um, all of these four outputs um, from the Qubit Chords module, which, again, is the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh of any chord so we can you know set the root key 
okay, using this big pitch knob here, we can set the type of chord, you know, between major or minor or dominant or suspended, even augmented. Now we're going to take these four outputs and we're going to route them directly into a VCA. Now a VCA is basically like a volume control here. We're going to be using the Erica Sense Black Quad VCA2. Now basically we're going to just route the inputs of those channels into the four inputs of this VCA. And these knobs here at the top are basically just volume knobs. We keep all of the volume knobs down and we send a trigger like an envelope trigger to the CV inputs and we can control these volume knobs opening up and letting the sound through. Now that sounds a little complicated and I'm going to try to go really slow here and explain this as I'm doing it. All right. Cool. Let's start with getting four matching chords out of the pile. Okay, we're going to plug in the root. We're going to plug that into input number one on this VCA. We're going to take the third and we're going to plug that into the input number two of this VCA. We're going to take the fifth output and plug that into input number three. We're going to take the seventh output and we're going to plug that into input number four. So we've got all four of these notes in the chord coming out into their own individual volume control. And that's really key here. Take a breath. I always find a hard time sort of finding my breath control in the beginning of these videos because this mic is like this close to my mouth and if I you know breathe at all I'm suddenly Darth Vader in here so I'm sort of trying to hold my breath a little bit while I talk and kind of not breathe um, directly um, so that's a little bit tedious so I apologize as I kind of find the rhythm here with the voice and the mic and all that guys okay Let's go ahead now, um, and we need to um, make um, a way for ourselves to actually hear the volumes of these sounds as we start you know, turning up the volume. You can see we can't actually hear anything because the outputs of this mixer aren't routed into anything. Now we need to route these outputs individually into some other you know, module that can handle and deal with these sounds. So there's four outputs on the bottom of this module of the quad of the Black Quad BCA2 from Erica Sense. Now I'm going to take an output, one from each of those outputs, and we're going to route that into a mixer so that we now have volume control over each one of these notes individually. Okay, now stick with me here. This is a mini mixer from Dopefer. It's got four inputs, and we have exactly four things that we need to mix. So this is going to be a perfect mixer for us to use today. We're going to route the four individual outputs individually into this mini mixer from Dopefer. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that now. I'll need four matching cables again. So we'll dig out of the pile here. Perfect. So we're going to take output one and we're going to plug this into input one of the mixer. I'm going to turn these volumes on the mixer channels down for now. We're going to take output two. We're going to plug that into input two of the mixer. We're going to take output three and we're going to run that into input. Did I say output? So we're taking the outputs over here from the black quad VCA and we're running those into the inputs individually of this mixer. Okay? So let's go over this routing one more time because there's a few extra cables that are kind of sitting here that aren't part of what we just built. These are just parts of the clock so that when I press play over here on the black sequencer, it sends a signal over here to these multiples where I can now patch as many versions of the start and the reset signal as I need. Let's go over here to start this um, sequencer, which we're not actually using yet today. Um, so we've now routed the four 
individual outputs of the cord module. We've routed those into four individual inputs of this VCA, which is basically a volume control. These are basically volume knobs, okay? And all the volume knobs are down. Then we've taken the individual outputs there, and we're routing those into a mixer. So now we have individual volume control over each one of these notes that are coming out of the module. Now we just need a way to hear these, so we'll need to route an output from this mixer into my main mixer here, which I'm using the 1010 blue box. And I did um, a video, a live stream rather, specifically on getting started with this guy. Pardon my head in the shot, everyone, as I try to um, load an empty project here for us to start with today. Okay, fantastic. Now we've got an empty session in the blue box. And what I can do, let's see if I can get this camera just a little bit out of the way. Okay, whoops, some cables there. Sorry, everyone. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to be running that into one and two. And for now, let's skip this reverb and just do this one step at a time. All right. So now I'm going to take the right out from this mixer, and I'm going to run that, you know, into the right of this whoops, recording mixer here, the blue box, so we can actually start to hear what's happening today, and left into left. Okay. Now, if everything is working correctly, if I turn these volumes up over here, now when we activate the volume knobs on the VCA, let me change cameras again, and thank you for your patience as we keep swapping. Okay, so now we have individual volume control, and when I actually turn these volumes up, we should start hearing something. Okay, so here we're hearing a note, here we're hearing another note, and another note, and another note. And if I turn them all up, it's actually a chord. Now, like I said earlier, we can change the root note of our chord with the tuning knob. Or we can get crazy with it, right? But here we have a minor chord, and it sounds really nice. And we have individual control over each of the four notes that are making up this chord. If we control the volume of these knobs individually, we have total control over the volume of each of those four notes. Okay, are you with me so far? I'm going to check in with the chat and see if we have any questions uh, thus far. Again, sorry that I'm a little bit off with the chat because it's normally right here on the monitor in front of me. And today it's, you know, not. So apologies, everyone. Uh, if you're asking about the main desk here, Tony, this is a custom desk that I had built to fit the space after I had the acoustic treatment done in here. Uh, if you're asking about this case here, this is a custom case as well that I had built um, specifically to house all my Euro rack. Um, Uh, yeah, we're not going to be focusing on changing the actual uh, chord itself today, uh, Jeremy. We're just going to do some super, like, uh, dubby techno kind of stuff. But there are um, CV inputs on this to where you can actually do that. You know, change, um, change the, uh, excuse me, the voicing to go from major to minor and diminished and suspended or to change the pitch and stuff. We're going to do this really simply today and kind of just create... Um, like a, a one chord um, groove. But I can't stress this enough. Each step in this take in the, each step in this technique takes this idea to a whole kind of new level. It's going to take quite a few steps for me to really get to the end product that I'm trying to get across today. So bear with me, you guys. This might be a bit of a of a long one. Um, 
And, and as always, thank you for your patience. We've got a couple of extra cables there that I'm just going to pull because they're not really part of what we're doing. Okay, so what we need to do is we now need to come up with a way to actually trigger these volumes to open and close without us having to sit here and, you know, open and close them manually. And what we're going to need for that is we're going to need an envelope generator. And I've got a fabulous envelope generator over here from Mazatron. It is their poly envelope generator and LFO. Now let me explain a little bit about this module here, you guys. We're going to be running trigger signals into these four inputs here. And I've got it set here to trigger so it knows that I'm sending in a trigger signal as opposed to a gate signal. Uh, we've got a medium, low, and high envelope settings. We've got an attack setting, and we've got a release setting of the envelope that we're generating. We've actually got a way to CV control those uh, as well, the attack and the release. But we're not really going to be worried about that today. There's quite a few ideas, I think, um, that could maybe take this concept to another level and get it even more interesting. But today, we're just going to do the most basic stuff uh, to actually get it going. So we're going to need to route in four separate triggers here so that we can trigger the outputs of four separate envelopes. Let's get that started, shall we? That's the reason why I have um, the Erica Sense drum sequencer all routed in and starting up today. Whew. We're going to go ahead and we're going to we're going to create some random elements right off the jump. We're going to use um, the drum sequencer here to send out some triggers. But we don't want those triggers to trigger the exact same envelopes um, all the time because that's not going to give us any level of random. What we want is we need um, these trigger signals that are going to um, trigger and activate this envelope generator, we need those to have a little bit of random built right into those signals so that it's going to change and evolve how it actually pings and opens up these envelopes. Here's how we're going to accomplish that step of this. I've got um, the branches module here from Mutable Instruments. And this is a really great module for adding a bit of random to your patches. We're going to take a trigger input, and we're going to plug it into the input of the module. Now, each time that branches receives a trigger input, it does sort of like a, like a virtual coin toss. And if it comes up heads, it's going to send that trigger out of output A. If it comes up, you know, virtual coin toss tails, it's going to send that um, trigger signal out of output B. Now, what does this mean exactly? We've got two different inputs um, here, and we have four possible outputs here. So if I use a combination of two different trigger signals, we can actually get four different outputs coming from this module. And we can use those outputs to trigger the, um, the, the, the VCA that's controlling our sounds. Now, let me show you exactly what I mean by that. Okay. We're going to take, let's see, okay. We're going to take, um, let's take a trigger out here, and we're going to plug that into the, in, let's take a closer one, shall we? I'm going to plug that into the input of branches. Before I go any further, I'll need to uh, go ahead and clear out this pattern we're working with. Uh, let's see here, clear... One, or is it one clear? Um, maybe we'll just work in a different pattern then. All right, fantastic. So we're working with trigger 10 here. If I go to uh, select, if I select the right trigger, and if I put in some actual notes here, verify that I'm doing this correctly. Cool. Um, actually, that's got something going as well. So let me go to bank 2. Maybe we'll go to bank three, actually. Um, bank three, pattern one. 
Just trying to get into an empty pattern for us here to work with. Everyone, thanks for your patience. Um, the drum sequencer module actually doesn't allow me to load like a brand new project um, and get a clean slate, whereas their black sequencer absolutely allows me to do that. So a little bit of an inconsistency uh, with their uh, sequencers there. So I'm just trying to get us into a blank pattern real fast. Awesome. Okay, fantastic. Now, what we'll see, let me change the, am I on the right camera? I am on the right camera. Okay, so what we'll see here is that I'm sending some triggers out here. You know, you can see the light light up every time it's sending out a trigger. And that's going in to the branches module, which is now, you know, lighting up its LED whenever it receives a trigger signal. It doesn't actually have two LEDs, you know, to show you which output it's sending the signal from. That would be really awesome if it did, so you would, you know, have a visual representation. Um, you can also see that by default, we're sort of hardwired into the second part of the module if I don't put another input in. So you could actually get um, four random outputs from just this one um, you know, trigger input if you wanted to. But we're going to get a little bit more creative with this. And we're going to route a second trigger, okay, from the Erica Sense drum sequencer. We're going to route that into the second input on the branches module so that both inputs will be receiving triggers. We can see actually that as soon as I put um, the second input in, that the bottom, you know, LED here is no longer flashing because, you know, it's expecting a second signal now. You know, again, if, if I take that out, we're getting outputs, you know, randomly out of all four of those. But if I want to have a little more control, I can now send two triggers in, and it'll wait for this second trigger before our second LED lights up. I hope that makes sense so far. Bear with me, everyone. I know the setup on this one is kind of, you know, involved. Um, but what we need to do now is just simply... Uh, select that trigger, trigger number 11, and put in some notes to activate that as well. Now I'm going to zoom in again so we can see here on the sequencer that I'm sending, you know, notes out of two different triggers. And we're sending both of those triggers into the branches module. And now the LEDs are lighting up, but they're lighting up differently, not at the exact same time. And I just want to stress that even though there's only one LED for this, you know, each pair of outputs, that every time that light is blinking, it's actually, you know, sending um, the output out of only one of those two outputs, not all four at the same time. And that's really key here for us to get some random triggers happening. Okay. All right. What we need to do now is find four more cables that are the same length. See if we can do that. Whoops. Whoops. Okay. And now we just need to take, um, actually, these are probably going to be a little bit longer than what we need right now. No, nope, they're not, actually. Um, no, they are. Yeah, okay, sorry about that, everyone. We're going to take four shorter cables, and we're going to route these cables out of the branches module and into the Mazatron poly envelope generator that I showed you just a moment ago. And that uh, envelope generator is actually going to generate the envelopes that open up our VCA. So we're getting really close now. We're going to take output A from branches, and we're going to route that into the first trigger input of the Mazatron Poly Envelope Generator Module. So I'm taking, you know, the first output here, and we're running that into the trigger input, which now we can see every so often it's going to be sending a trigger signal, an envelope, you know, signal rather, out of that first envelope generator output here. Okay, but it's not consistently flashing because we've created that random element on when these triggers are actually triggering. We're going to take output 2. We're going to plug that into input 2. We're going to take down at the bottom output A into trigger 3. 
and output B into trigger N4. And now what we'll see on the envelope generator module here is that all of the outputs are sending envelopes out of those, out of those outputs there. But you can see that they're not triggering at the same time. And it's really like a random, it's not any sort of repeating sequence. And this is really key here. Okay, I'm going to take a second and check in with the chat. Make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Hey, we got 25 people in the chat. All right. Oh, hey, real quick also. Um, sorry, guys. I started... I've just started, rather, uh, a channel membership to this channel as well. If you look uh, directly under my videos, there's now going to be a join button, I believe, next to the like and subscribe buttons. That's for people uh, who you know, have been getting some benefit out of the channel and might like to support the channel uh, and the progress of the channel, but don't maybe want to go over to Patreon or go off of YouTube. Now there's just a join button directly um, beneath my videos where you can join up, become a part of Dean's Synth Squad, and help support the channel that way. Your support is greatly appreciated, everyone. Um, okay, so let me just make sure that I'm not missing any questions, and we'll start routing... Um, these envelopes to the VCA. Hey, all right. Good to see you, Ed. From Saunders' channel. I'm going to have to check that out. Thanks, Supachu. It is exactly a Bernoulli gate. Well, and I'm sorry I did not say that, everyone. Thanks, Wall. I appreciate that a lot. The branches module, where we're feeding that trigger in, and it's kind of rolling a vir or tossing a virtual coin and deciding which output that comes out of, that module is like the process it's doing is called a Bernoulli gate. Thanks very much, Wall. I really appreciate that. Okay, everyone. So we've got our envelopes. Um, triggering. They're triggering randomly now. And we're going to take um, these four chords here. And we're going to route each of these envelopes into the CV input over here on the black quad VCA. And we're going to now start hearing these notes actually being triggered. The neat thing, the really neat thing about this All right is that with Eurorack, we're often kind of co trying to come up with ways to create like random melodies and random melodic elements. But it's sometimes difficult to keep those like in key with each other. But this way, I can change, you know, the chord to anything I want. And we're gonna get to that level of this in a moment. But no matter what kind of melodic um, pitch I'm spitting out, the melodic arpeggio that we're creating is always going to be in relative key with itself and with the chord that's coming out of the main mix here on this module. Let's slow our tempo down quite a bit. So we're basically just randomly triggering four different notes of a chord. We can change the envelope using, you know, the poly envelope generator from Mazatron. We can make it longer. We can have the envelope kind of fade in, right? We can make it even shorter. and make this a little bit more interesting and not quite so dry. Awesome. Now, unfortunately, my VCAs aren't bringing the volume down to zero. So we sort of get that, that hum in the background. And I'm not exactly sure what we would do to like get rid of that other than to maybe just filter it down or something. 
Um, but when the music's going in the background, you don't necessarily hear that hum. So I think we're not really going to worry about it so much um, at this time. I'm trying to think if there's like a convenient way that I could just sort of route that into a into a mixer or something for us so that we might have just the tiniest little bit of more control over the volume um, there. And I think we can do that actually. Um, let's see, by routing. Yeah, cool. What we're going to do is we're going to route um, our individual um, channel mixer here into another mixer, which will have, you know, control over the volume. And then we're going to take the output of that second mixer and send that to um, the speakers instead. So let me get that routed here. Here's a left. Let me get this out of the way. And the right. Okay, and then we'll just take... Cool. Just going to grab the output from that mixer here and route it into another mixer so that I will have control over the volume and we don't have to have that sort of going in the background the entire time of the stream. All right. Let's see here. Let me... Um, what am I doing wrong? There we go. Okay, now in between the talking, I can actually just turn the volume on this mixer down so it's not sort of coming through in any sort of a layer. Cool, okay. So what I wanna do um, is I actually wanna route this mixer into um, the uh, black hole reverb pedal from Eventide. So, let's see, this is left. So let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna use the the Strymon AA1 module, which allows us to route um, any signal we want, any audio signal we want from the case into this module. And then we get the ability um, to send out uh, like a stereo output and bring back a stereo output as well so that we can, um, you know, run guitar pedals and whatnot um, in our system. The Strymon AA1 module. I have two of these now, one on each side of the case so that we can bring the audio signals out of the case and run those into, you know, pedals and whatnot. Um, okay. So we just need to route this mixer into, yeah, that'll work, left, into the AA1 module so that I can send that signal we're now sending this signal out of the case and into the Eventide black hole reverb pedal, which is sitting over here on the side. Okay, and I've got control of the volume of that now by this mixer here. So here we hear that arpeggio starting to go through the black hole reverb. You know, we can drown it, you know, or just keep it sort of mellow. I think we'll do for now, just keep it sort of mellow. Just put a little bit of extra texture on that sound. Fantastic. Let's go a little bit slower. So we can really focus in on what those notes are doing, right? It's just randomly picking between these four notes and it's opening up this VCA to send those through based on the envelopes that we've created using that Mazatron poly envelope generator so I can make the envelope you know really tiny or really long you can make it longer you know but don't really need to because I'm looking for more of an arpeggio type of sound today awesome I think let's take um, one more step as well, and let's make it so that we can actually filter the sound um, of these notes as well. So I'm currently taking a stereo out from this dope for mixer, and we're routing that into a you know two inputs over here on this Beefbacco hex mix, and I'm running that stereo out here from the hex mix 
all the way to the Strymon AA1, which we're able to then send the signal to the black hole reverb. So if I want to filter the sound that's coming out of this mixer here, we have two options. I could pan everything to the left and take just the left output of this mixer and use that as a mono signal. But we currently have a stereo signal that we're working with, left and a right. And what I'm going to do is take um, these outputs, and instead of routing them from the mixer to that Strymon AA1 module, we're going to route them into a filter instead. We're going to go ahead and route them into the uh, moon phase filter from Patching Panda, which is a fabulous filter, and I absolutely need to spend more time with it, but there's only so many hours in the day. So we're going to take, um, let's see here, where did I drop that accidentally there? Um, just lost the cable. There it is. Okay, so we're going to plug these both into the inputs of this filter over here. And I'm just going to run a gentle stereo low pass uh, filter setting on the moon phase here. So it's going to allow us to do some gentle filtering on these notes. We're going to now take the output of this module and we're going to patch that into the Strymon AA1 so that we can continue to get that signal out of the case and into the pedal. I'm going to find two uh, matching cables for that. Make sure they're long enough. I don't know if this is a pair or not. Let's find out. This might work. Barely. <laughs> Nope, I need the next length up. No worries. I'm just going to grab that off my little rack here and behind the camera. Okay, so we're going to take left out from the filter into left in of the Strymon AA1, and then we're going to take right out from the filter into right in of the Strymon AA1. So all we've done is just taken the output of this mixer and routed that into a filter before it is going to the reverb. And there we go. So here's our clean signal. Change the EQ on this just a little bit here. Awesome. And now we can filter that down. Okay. Maybe put a little more resonance on that. Awesome. So we have just a tiny little bit more, you know, uh, character and that sound now before it actually hits the reverb. Now here's the total bonus, you guys, is that we've taken those four outputs here from the chord module, but we still have this extra mix output here. And what this is doing is, you know, we're not sending any trigger signals or, or any gauge or trigger signals into the module. We're just taking these raw outputs, which are always outputting sound, and then we're uh, running those through envelopes so we can control when the sound turns on and off. So we're going to do that exact same thing here with the mix of all four of these coming out of one output. We can still get a full chord sound coming out over the top of these that will always be in tune with the arpeggio that we've created underneath the chord. And what we're going to do here is we're going to need to route uh, the mix of this module out into, um, into another envelope. Um, so that we can control um, that as well. And let's go ahead and take the mix out here, and let's route that into the tone module from Qubit, which is a uh, four um, low-pass filters module. So this is the Qubit tone here. Each of these knobs in the middle is a separate low-pass filter. I've got CV control over um, the filters here. So if I can plug like an envelope in to the CV input, and I can say how much uh, effect it should have over the filter, and how much it should open and close that filter to let the sound through. Um, I guess I was on the wrong camera that whole time, wasn't I? Sorry about that. Let me just show you really quick here what that actually looks like then. Okay, cool. So this is the tone module. We've got four different knobs. It's four different inputs. You could run like, you know, two different stereo pairs in here or four different mono pairs. And we're just using the top filter here. I've got the cutoff on that all the way down. 
and the CV input here is available for us to run an envelope shape into. I've got their at uh, attenuator, whatever you call this, how much it affects um, the filter knob. I've got this turned to maximum over here so that when we run an envelope shape in here, it's going to send the maximum effect of that envelope to this knob here as if we were opening and closing it real fast and creating an envelope. So what I'm going to do is we use the uh, Mazatron uh, poly envelope generator to generate our first uh, four envelopes to trigger uh, the quad VCA. Now what we'll do, um, let's see here. We're going to use the Zadar to create another envelope. And what the Zadar is, is it is a, um, it's another envelope generator module. And if I get it lit up here, we can see that it's got a little shape here at the top, and it's got like 277 um, envelope shapes in it. It's got four different um, uh, envelopes that you can set up at once. So we could have anything from like a long uh, evolving envelope to something like this, what I've got here. Just a really short kind of pinging envelope. And that's what we're going to use to sort of ping this filter and open this filter and allow the sound of our chord sound to come through. Now bear with me on this, you guys, because this is going to start to take this to a whole other level here. We're going to take the output of that first envelope from Zadar. We're going to run that in to the uh, tone module here. Now we just need a way um, to trigger that envelope. And we're going to go ahead and just use um, the Erica Sense uh, drum sequencer again for this. I'm going to run this into the uh, trigger input of the Zadar. And now all I need to do is select that trigger, put an actual trigger in, and then tell the Erica Sense drum sequencer that I would like um, that trigger to happen how often? Uh, maybe right now, maybe once every four bars, we could have that happen. So once every four bars, it can ping um, the on the downbeat rather of the of the of the downbeat of four, every four bars on the downbeat. It will ping this envelope um, to sort of open up this chord shape here. And <laughs> let's see here. We just need to now route. Um, some some uh, volume out of the actual tone module so that we can hear this chord. And what let's do is let's sort of keep the chord separate um, in the mix. You know, we have our arpeggio part of the chord running out of the case and into the eventide black hole pedal. So let's uh, do something differently with this sound, okay? We're going to take um, the low pass output is also a band pass output. So these could be f uh, four low pass filters or four band pass filters. Um, I'm much more into using a low pass filter these days uh, than band pass. So that's what we're going to go with. And then we'll just need to route this into, um, maybe we'll route this into a, uh, a DJ filter so I can uh, either remove the highs if I want or remove the lows if we want. Um, and then from the DJ filter, let's run that out into a the Desmodus Versio reverb so that we can get some, um, you know, individual reverb on the chord sound as well to help it blend with the individual reverb that we've got coming out of the actual arpeggio notes through the black hole reverb. Let's get two reverbs going here. Okay, let's see what we've got going and I believe that is going to be all we need that I remember to save. Okay. Now we can actually separate uh, these as well. Okay, fantastic. It's totally working. And let me just remove these extra triggers. There we go. Fantastic. Almost. Yeah, cool. Now, every four bars, it's going to trigger that chord. Now, we can adjust. Um, I see. I still have too many triggers there. We can adjust. Bar. There it is. Okay, fantastic. So now we have it set to every four bars. It's going to trigger that chord. Now we can really um, start to decide what key we'd like to actually uh, work in and whatnot. 
And how we can do that is I have a, a, a tuner module here. It's the, the data Mordax. It's actually quite a bit more than a tuner. It's an oscilloscope and um, all sorts of stuff. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to take the root note output of our chord and we're going to run that into the tuner here. And now I can actually set what key we're going to work in uh, by setting whatever the root note is. I really like to work in the key of F minor. So I'm going to attempt to go ahead and set this root note coming out here to, um, to an F. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So here I am taking just the root output, okay? Now, all of these five outputs are putting out, you know, audio right now. We don't have anything controlling, um, like, the trigger of this module at all. So it's just constantly spitting out output. So if I take the root note, you know, and we run that into something that can read that and help me tune it, now I can get it, like, as close to, you know, an F as I possibly can here, try to get that line right in the center. It's sometimes it's really, really difficult to get it right on. We're almost perfect. There we go. All right. See how the line is really close now? And that's reading an F2. So the root note is spitting out um, an F here, which means that, you know, if I have the module set to minor, that we're playing an F minor chord. And so the arpeggio is going to adhere to that as well. We're playing, you know, a random uh, arpeggio in the key of F minor and over the top of that we're going to be putting out an F minor chord. Now let's see how this works and I'll get back into the chat answer any questions that may have come up. Okay we just need to plug this one back in. Fantastic. So now we've changed the key that we're working in and you'll hear as I turn up the arpeggio that we have control over that it matches the tone and the key. We're in key in the right scale of every time that chord hits. And we can filter the arpeggio. We've got quite a lot of reverb tail happening from both of these elements. A lot of reverb coming here from the eventide black hole pedal and also a lot of reverb coming from the Desmodus Versio from Noise Engineering. Again, we've routed the chord itself into a DJ filter here so that I can kind of high pass it by turning this knob to the right or low pass it by turning the knob to the left. If I turn it all the way to the left, you'll notice that the chord completely disappears because I've filtered it all the way out bring this filter up a little bit. And you see we're starting to hear the chord again. And if I bring this filter up a little bit more, we're now removing more low frequencies from that chord. I'm turning this into a high pass filter. Okay. So we can kind of dial that where we like it on just the chord part of things. I could put more reverb on that chord if we want. Really start to drown it and create a texture in the background. Hear that tail just go forever now? Cool. Here's what we're gonna do. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna tell um, the chord to not trigger every four bars, but rather to trigger every eight bars instead so that we can kind of utilize this really long tail that the reverb generates. So let me go ahead and make this trigger only happen every eight bars instead of every four on the chord itself. And what let's do now maybe is see about bringing up a little bit of a drum groove and see what we can do here. Start bringing our tempo up just a little bit, shall we? Now that we've kind of got an idea of what's happening with those notes and the chord and how they're always staying in key with each other, I'm gonna start to check in with the chat as we got this groove playing here. 
sorry that I haven't been able to very often this stream, guys. And we got 29 people watching. I really appreciate you all sticking around and hanging out with me. What's happening, Jeremy? What's happening, Joshua? What's happening, Philip? Hey, John. Hey, Andy. Yeah, it's very, very complex. In fact, um, for those of you who may be interested in Euro Rack, but maybe afraid of the complexity of it, you know, you're not alone. Um, it took me quite a few starts and stops with Euro Rack to kind of like sort of get my mind uh, around the basics enough so that it wasn't just constantly watching tutorials to get started. And with Euro Rack, I think that. You know, once you do get some of those basics down, it's really easy then to start building off of those basics really, really slowly and learning new concepts um, to add to those. But getting those very, very basic things down to where you're kind of, you know, understanding how the envelopes work, how the gates work, and how you can actually get sound coming out. That took me like about maybe five or six real, I'm going to learn it this time and here we go. And then it didn't quite work out, you know, and then maybe a few months or even a year later I would try again. Um, so yeah, if you don't really necessarily gel with the concept of Euro Rack on your first or your second attempt to, don't let that get you down. Don't let that get you down. All right. Let's see here. Um, let's take this to the next step because there's still one more really awesome thing that we can do here. To get a little bit more variety, checking my volume on the... Can you guys still hear me now that I've added the drums and whatnot? Just let me know if I'm getting too loud or if anybody's speakers are distorting or anything like that, or if you need me to adjust uh, my vocals up or down according to the music, just let me know in the chat. If we listen close, and if I kind of get the drums out here, we'll listen to that every single time um, the chord hits. It's the exact same chord, right? We do have the ability to filter, you know, our arpeggio part. But it's not moving on its own. I have to actually do that. And basically what's, you know, the benefit here is if we can program as many things as possible to do their own type of movement so that we don't necessarily, we only have two hands, right? So one of the things that we could do very easily is we could, um, Sorry about all the background hums as I like the, you know, the reverb pretty serious in the mix and whatnot. Um, so we'll keep, you know, working that um, as it's appropriate for the speaking parts, guys. Um, one of the things that we'll notice is that, you know, the notes and the actual chord uh, that we're arpeggiating don't change. And the chord itself doesn't change um, tonality wise. And it might be really awesome if we could create uh, that to happen. And we can. Um, but first, we're going to go ahead and route an LFO to the movement on this filter so that it's kind of doing a little bit of filter sweeping um, always without us having to worry about doing that manually. And what we're going to do, let's see here, is we're going to take an LFO, and I have a module from DivKit called OCHD, O-C-H-D, um, and what this allows us to do is it allows us to create um, eight different LFOs. These are just unsynced to tempo, triangle waveform LFOs that we can run out of this module here, and they're all a little bit different speeds. Okay, so we're going to take an LFO from that module there, an LFO so that triangle shape, so we can just kind of gently sweep our filter cutoff knob up and down. And to do this, let's see here. We're just going to um, we're going to we're going to need a way um, to attenuate this LFO so that we can decide just exactly how much of this shape is moving the knob. Okay. Um, if I just plug an LFO directly into um, 
a destination, it's going to move that knob 100% to the left, and then 100% to the right, and then 100% to the left. You follow what I'm saying? And what we want is we want that knob to hang out, you know, at a different position and not open and close all the way, but just a subtle amount that we sort of desire. And that's what the attenuator is going to allow us to do. It's going to allow us to shape the range of that LFO and make it a shorter range if we want or a longer range if we want. So let's go ahead and take the output of this attenuator and we're going to need a longer cable there and we're going to route that into the cutoff whoops, I already have one ready to go, of the filter module. And now we can adjust just how much sweep is happening on the filter there. So we'll go ahead and get this in the mix here. And we're listening to the chords now, I mean the arpeggio part now. We can hear a little bit of movement start on the filter here. All right. Very slowly and subtly, we're moving the cutoff of this filter here now underneath in, 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 and independent of whatever that chord stab is doing. Just a little bit of extra movement there on that filter. Nice. Might be nice, actually, if we took a moment and we do a little bit more to those notes so that they just um, don't only just have that reverb and that filter movement, but we could maybe add a little bit of delay as well to give maybe a little bit more interest in what that arpeggio is doing. How we can do that is, let's see here, we're currently taking um, the output out of... Um, of our filter here and then we're running that into um, the black hole reverb but if I take the output of this filter and I run it instead into a delay module and then we run the output of this delay module into uh, the reverb that might be awesome so let's go ahead and see if we can't take a moment and set that up shall we we're just going to take um, these outputs here and we're going to uh, swap them from coming out of the filter module to actually coming out of this delay module instead. And then all I will need to do is just route an output from the filter module into the delay module so that we're sending this sound into this module. But I'd like the delay to be tempo synced to our project. Okay, this is the um, the the module that I'm using for delay right now is the Erica Synth Black Stereo Delay. It's a really large module and really robust delay module here. Um, but it's got a, a CV input for tap tempo, for tapping uh, the tempo that we want the delays to be at. And I've got next to the um, Erica Sense uh, stereo delay here. I've got a clock divider which has some really interesting divisions of our main clock. So I can run our clock in here and then I can take a divided by two, divided by three, divided by four, five, six, seven, or eight division of that clock and I can run that into the tap tempo of our delay giving me control over the timing of that delay but staying in sync with our project globally. Now how we need to do that <coughs> excuse me is we just need to run our main clock into the clock input of this clock divider module here and that's why I have all these multiples in the middle of my system here so that when I run the clock and reset out of the Erica Sense black sequencer I run that into these multiples in the middle and then I can send the clock signal and reset signal out to any other modules in the case that may need it. So we're going to go ahead and send a clock signal to the clock divider over here and we're going to take a divided by three output and we're going to run that into the tap 
input of this delay. So when I start the clock now, this is going to start tapping the delay at a tempo of divided by three of our main tempo, okay? And create kind of a triplet rhythm in uh, the delay here. Let's go ahead and see if we can actually hear what we're, what we're starting to create here. So, first I need to bring the input level up a bit more on this. So we can hear those uh, arpeggio notes coming through. Now I need to just adjust the dry wet to taste here. Go really crazy on it, or just add a little. So we're only affecting the notes now in the arpeggio and giving them just a tiny little bit more interest and layer. I'm going to try divided by five clock on those and see what that does to the delay. Let's try divided by six. Let's try divided by two. back to three. Cool. Put that reverb back up a little bit over here. So again, we've got both the arpeggio notes now and the over-the-top chord running through their own reverbs. Bring that chord reverb back up. Okay, so there's that chord triggering at the beginning of eight bars while the arpeggio just kind of does its random thing, right? But now we're using the reverb from the chord to create just this nice wash over the whole thing, right? This is just bringing in some rhythm casually, just so we can get that in a context that makes a little more musical sense, what we're doing here. Okay, but still, it's a little bit static. Even though our chord is moving, Excuse me, even though our arpeggio is, you know, triggering in a random way, every single time that chord hits, it is exactly the same, right? So this is a neat technique that really takes this to another level, I think. On the chords module itself, we have the ability to change the voicing of the chord. Now what this is going to do is basically, you know, give you a regular minor chord, you turn it up a little, maybe it'll give you a minor seventh chord. You turn it up a little more, now it's maybe like a minor eleventh chord or something like that. So we're changing the voicing of the chord. We're not changing whether it's like major or minor, and we're not uh, changing the key that it's in, we're just kind of changing the chord formation using this voicing knob here. I'm going to start playing the groove and move that knob around so you guys can hear what I'm saying. Actually, let's start with it on the very bottom. And immediately you can hear how that chord is different sounding. I'm going to go ahead and turn this up a little. Turn these arps back up as well. Listen for the chord hit, you guys. If I turn this up, every time the chord hits, that voicing knob will have an impact on... Bring it up even more now. You can hear the notes underneath it start to change as well, because we're changing the voicing of the chord. But the notes will always stay in key with whatever the chord hit is. Put 
put this back in the middle again. And now what we want to do is we want to create a way to send, um, excuse me, <coughs> to send um, um, a CV modulation command to this patch point so that it randomly changes what this voicing knob is going to do and that every time it triggers the chord that it will trigger a different slightly different voicing of that chord and how it's being played and the arpeggio underneath it will follow along as we do that we bring this reverb and stuff down just a little bit you guys okay so what we're going to do to create that is we're going to use um, sample and hold Okay, now what is sample and hold exactly? We're going to use, um, to, to, to make this happen, we're going to use, um, where is that module now? Um, the sample and hold module from DivKid, um, which is called Random Step. Okay, and what we want is we need um, to send a trigger to this module to let it know what the tempo we're working with is. So we can send it our clock signal. Or if we want it to be at a slower tempo than like our main 16th note clock, we can use a clock divider to achieve this. Let me go ahead and zoom in on what I'm talking about a little bit. So you use it on this one? No, I'll change that. Okay. So what we're going to, what am I doing here? There we go. Okay, fantastic. Um, I've got a clock divider here from Mazatron which allows me to divide the clock by 1, by 2, by 4, by 8, 16, 32, 24, or 128. Now, if I divide our main, our, our main clock signal, which is like 16th notes, if I divide that by 128, what this ends up doing is it ends up singing, uh, sending rather a gate signal out every eight bars, and it will hold that gate signal for a full eight bars, and then every um, eight bars it's going to you know send out another trigger signal here. Now that signal is going to be the same every single time it comes out of this output, unless we route it into something to make it not the same. So deep buried in here is the random step module from DivKid. And I'm going to take this divided by 8 clock here, this not divided by 8, but this divided by 128 clock. And I'm going to use that as the um, trigger source for this random step module. Okay, and that's basically going to send a gate signal to the random step module and trigger it every 8 bars. Now the benefit of the random step module is it allows us to bring the power of random back into the mix kind of the same way that we were able to do over here with the Bernoulli gate module the branches module from mutable instruments we want to get this variety in so that the patch is kind of alive and kind of doing things that we don't have to think about and we can start thinking about other things to control so if we take a divided by 128 clock and feed that into the trigger input of the random step, it's now literally just triggering that every 8 bars on the downbeat of every 8 bars. We're going to feed a white noise signal into the sample input. Okay, We're going to sample a source and then we're going to hold that, that source. Now noise contains um, you know all of the frequencies like white noise it's just you know it's got a very wide spectrum of um, values per se now the noise is being fed into the sample and hold module and it's just you know random levels basically and every eight bars the gate signal is going to be sent to that white noise and it's going to hold it wherever it grabs it in that spectrum randomly from, it could be anywhere in that noise spectrum, which is huge. This is a little bit complicated, so bear with me on this. But it's going to grab and it's going to hold that value. The key here is that the white noise is being able to generate lots of different values that the sample and hold module can grab onto. And then it will send out a different result as it grabs those different values. It's a little bit complicated, but very powerful. Sample and hold. So what we're going to do now 
is we're just going to take um, the output, I need a longer cable here, we're going to take the output of the sample and hold module, again, that we just told to every eight bars, create a new and random value signal and hold that for eight bars. Okay, and we're going to, I'm a little bit confused all of a sudden, and we're going to patch that into the voicing on the chord, okay, which is the knob here that changes what, um, uh, how the chord is being voiced, whether we're doing like a minor, a major, or whether like the root maybe is on top instead of on the bottom, stuff like that, okay. Um, and now it's going to randomly choose a different voicing on this chord every eight bars. But so we can hear it a little bit, you know, better changing. I'm going to switch that to every four bars as we get started in this groove. Turn the drums down and see what we can do here. Fantastic. So we're already triggering a little bit of difference here. I mean, in fact, start bringing these things up here. Bring this reverb back. Now, the notes under the chord, the arpeggio notes, are going to change to follow along with the voicing change. So as we're, you know, if we're holding down four notes, four notes, you know, it's going to pick those four notes to arpeggiate. But if we're holding down a different set of four notes, now it has those four notes to arpeggiate. So let's just listen to this for a moment, and I'll stop talking so that you guys can hear how it's actually changing. I think we want to bring this whole thing up an octave as well today. And uh, let me show you how we're going to achieve that. I have a module here called Volt. And this is from WMD Devices, and it allows me to really quickly and easily um, do like an octave up on a sound or like an octave up on a sound. And I can, uh, without even patching anything into the module, I can just take an output here from output A, and I can just press up or down on the module, and that's going to send an extra volt out and change the octave of whatever I send this into. Let me show you what I mean by that. Because we're not, um, uh, because we're not triggering the module itself, and because it's just always spitting out noise, I still have the volt per octave input on this module available to us. So if I just take an output from that volt module that I just showed you, and I run it into the volt per octave input of this module. Now I can start the groove again. Maybe get the drums back in so we can count some time here. Now if I just press the button, we can go up an octave on this module. And it just stays in key. We're just taking the whole module up an octave. If I press the button again, we'll go up another octave. Get really high up there. But I'm just gonna go one octave up only, I think a lot. I like that. I could have also just, you know, gone back in and retuned our root note, you know, manually to an octave higher, but this gives us the ability to kind of flex this in real time, push it back down to the original octave, or go an octave up, you know, as I push those buttons. So here we've got lots of different reverb tails happening. The chord is starting to evolve now, and we've got, you know, kind of a neat groove happening here in the key of F minor, but it's sort of doing a bit of evolving on its own as to what these melodic elements are doing. And that's the key here, is that the chord is changing its voicing every now and again, and the arpeggio notes are following along. We got 34 people hanging out. I really appreciate you guys hanging out. Let's see if I've missed any uh, questions. If there's been any important questions, please feel free to ask those again. Hey, Douglas. Hey, we got Slim Pickens. Asking a great question. Slim Pickens says, is the arpeggio and the chord 
the same sounds from the same module, but just patched differently. And that is exactly what is going on here. Uh, let me bring these volumes down a bit. Cool. And let me just zoom in on this again here. And what we've done is we've taken these outputs on the qubit chord module. It has five outputs on the bottom. The output on the right here is just a mix output. It's mixing all four of these outputs into one output. So it's sending the whole chord out of one output. Whereas these outputs here are dividing up the chord into individual notes. So the first output is the root, then we have the third, then the fifth, and the seventh. Now I'm running those outputs individually into the um, black VCA2 from Erica Synths, which is basically um, our volume control over those individual sounds. We've used the envelope generator, poly envelope generator from Mazatron to generate four different envelopes. We've got some um, random elements in how we're triggering those en uh, envelopes using um, the uh, Bernoulli gate module from Mutable Instruments, which is called Branches. So we're getting those triggers triggered a little bit randomly. So the pattern they're generating is constantly sort of evolving. But it's always staying in key with whatever chord, you know, is coming out of the mix. The mix is just a mix of those four notes. So as we adjust the voicing of this chord and tell it, you know, to move around how it's actually playing those four notes, the arpeggio follows along because they're all just coming out of the same output. I'm using a random uh, sample and hold signal to trigger the voicing so that currently every four bars it chooses a different voicing of that main chord stab to play and the notes in the arpeggio underneath it just sort of follow along. Now if you didn't have the chord module from Qubit and you still wanted to utilize this sort of technique in getting some like four note uh, random arpeggios, you could have just four different oscillators that are tuned um, to complementary notes that are in the same chord and then running those into a VCA as well. Um, if you duplicate that somewhere along the line, you, that, um, that signal, you could even uh, still use the chord technique uh, over the top of those as well. Um, I hope that answers that question. Get these reverbs back up in the mix here. Yeah, I can actually um, change the color of, um, of the built-in light to the case. And I can actually set it um, to scroll through these colors as well. But I'm kind of plain and it's really easy just to see with the main light here. And that's kind of just what I've been using. No, no. I'm actually glad that you mentioned that, Ed, because I, uh, excuse me, um, Ned, because I'd love to address that. Ned says, like, I'm sorry, but are you joking? Who on earth is going to put together a system like you show here? Einstein is dead. Like, I completely agree with where you're coming from. The thing is, is that, you know, there's plenty of modular artists out there uh, that do have, you know, systems, and you don't need a super large system like this to get this sort of a technique together. This sort of a technique uh, might also be able to be created inside other apps like VCV Rack on the desktop or My Rack on the iPad. This is more of a concept um, on how to get some things um, together for people who are uh, using Eurorack in their in in their um, you know production or people who are interested in learning more about Eurorack. Um, for the most part, um, a lot of the techniques that I'm going to be showing on this channel aren't system specific. Like you, you could create this technique um, with any system if you had the chords module. And if you don't have the chords module, you can absolutely take four separate oscillators 
tune those to the notes in a chord and use that to generate this type of pattern. I understand that a lot of my users aren't going to have, you know, their own large Euro rack system, uh, but a lot of, I said users, I meant to say viewers, um, but a lot of my viewers are interested in Euro rack and are getting into Euro rack and are exploring uh, Euro rack in the iPad uh, app MyRack. Uh, as well. So these techniques and the concepts that I'm showing absolutely uh, transfer over to any other type of Eurorack systems um, and you know the information can be used that way. I certainly don't expect my viewers to have like the same system that I have or maybe the same size system that I have. All of the things in modular uh, and that's one of the beauty parts of modular is that it's such an um, independent journey and a different journey uh, for everyone depending on what you're into specifically whether you want to you know have a small case that maybe is just full of synthesizer and elements where you can create your own custom type of Euro rack synthesizer. Now, a lot of people like to just put effects and what and, and whatnot into a small case and use that as like a be all end all um, boutique effects box. What I built here is kind of like a be all end all groove box uh, for like my personal workflow. It's full of a lot of sampling. Uh, uh, boxes and samplers, um, some really serious uh, sequencers, lots of filters um, and whatnot, but certainly uh, no two people are going to have the same system. Uh, but these techniques absolutely are transferable and relatable, hopefully. So if you're into Eurorack, these might be applicable to you. And if you're not into Eurorack, we're just hanging out and having a good time creating some music today. All right. Get this back up in the mix. Okay, we've got a question from Wall here about sending clock from OM to the hardware. Uh, that's definitely possible. Um, in fact, the only thing about OM is that you can't um, uh, you can't um, control it with your hardware, so you can't make it accept MIDI clock in, but you can absolutely uh, send MIDI clock out to your hardware with OM. In fact, if I open it up here, um, don't, okay, fine. Um, over here on the left, okay, where, whoops. Okay, cool. Um, oh, uh, let's see if I can show this at all. Over here on the left, right, where you've got your tempo to set, if you click on these three dots over here, it's going to open up this uh, sort of window over here where we can, um, I know it's a little blurry on the live stream, sorry, but your um, whatever you've got your MIDI coming from that's attached to the iPad will show up here. So for instance, if you're running like a USB hub out of your iPad and you're running um, USB MIDI to your gear, here, you're going to want to activate MIDI clock to that, you know, um, to that USB hub. And you're going to want to make sure that your hardware is set to receive clock as well. Um, but you can absolutely uh, send clock from OM and use OM to start your gear. Absolutely. Um, you just can't do it the other way around. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, let's see here. And again, if there's any other questions, whether they be Euro Rack related, uh, iPad music making related, or just music uh, making related in general, please feel free to drop those in the chat. I'm trying to keep these sessions um, really casual, and I definitely, uh, you know, want to answer any questions um, that I'm able to answer as well. Um, am I? Uh, da, da, da. Uh, Hey, I appreciate that, Sky Stortus Fairy, man. That means a lot. Hey, what's happening? Synced Alien. All right. Not running MIDI to the gear. Then I'm not sure how you expect it to get clock. You have to... You have to connect it to the gear for sure. If you want, if you, you we'd either need to use um, uh, an, an like a um, an iRig MIDI 2. I've got a video on that uh, using 5-pin MIDI with iPads and whatnot. So you can um, you know 
plug that into your USB hub, the iRig MIDI 2, and then in OM you would just route your clock to that. Um, and if not, then it's just you know USB MIDI, and in OM you're going to route your clock to that. Let's see about maybe um, adding a little bit of a bass line to this groove, shall we? Bring these uh, reverbs back up. <laughs> cool. What is this, F minor? Cool. So I'm able to set the scale inside of the Erica Synths Black Sequencer and tell it that we're working in the key of F minor, pentatonic. And then I can start sending out um, some CV and gate information to some other modules that I've got here. And let me see if I can get this going real fast for us. That reverb tail we're hearing in the background is the Desmodus Versio that's just set um, to regen a lot. So it just basically creates a texture out of the, you know, the sounds that you send into it. Let's take uh, some smaller ones here. We're going to go out from this into a filter, into the in. Let's take the envelope. Into here. I'm just trying to get a bass sound patched up really fast so we can try to add a bass line to this really quickly here. And let's see. Um, waveform out to the end. I'm just going to play our groove in the background while I'm getting this patched up. Awesome. in the right key and there's no bass line. So the um, the black sequencer here allows me to set, you know, the key that we're working in. We got ourselves set up in the key of F minor. So if I just, you know, hit the, the random, is that gonna, what am I doing wrong here? I can start using this to generate some random bass lines that are in the key of that we're already working with. Bring the volume on that bass down, it's pretty loud. So it's like on uh, this one here. Hey, that's much better. Save that. Just gonna take out a few notes from that bass line, I think. Yeah, save that. I'm using a low pass filter on the bass sound. Kind of tuck that back down in the mix there. Let me show you what module I'm using for the bass sound. Let's see if we can get in these wires here. I'm taking a, you know, a CV and a gate out from the black sequencer here. And I'm running that into the Mazatron Wave Morph VC DCO oscillator. And then we've got a gate and a filter here from WMD devices so that we can get, you know, an envelope on this sound and a filter on this sound. Yeah. And see, 
over the top of our groove now. If we listen close, that chord is changing its voicing and the arpeggio is changing its four notes. Every four bars. Now, every now and again, because there's only so many varieties of chord voicing in the module, not like 20 or 30, but more like five or six, sometimes it triggers the same exact voicing because it's a random trigger through that sample and hold that we set up. So every now and again, you won't hear it change as well, which is sort of a neat and further unexpected thing. If we go back now and we change the um, trigger to trigger the chord voicing to change every eight bars instead of every four bars, we can start to get a more mellow and slower and more evolving groove, a sort of grooves for longer in between those changes on the notes. And again, I just had the drum machine here to the side today because that's what I was um, you know, using to show the patch in the beginning. I want to stress that again, that I'm experimenting with uh, a module here that allows me to sync the system up to Ableton Link on the Mac. And we're going to be doing some really deep dives coming up on how to do some setup like that as well. But we could absolutely take the time and just start programming drums out in the case as well. There's no real reason why I'm using this today. It's just kind of out to save us a little bit of time. So now every eight bars, that chord will change as it hits again. Thanks, Fade Man, I appreciate that. Absolutely, we could uh, slim pickings. That's one of the things that, um, let's see here. Oh, right, it would have to be on that side, but that's my voice too. One of the things um, that I did when I built the case is you know, because samples are really um, a big part of my workflow, um, I did want to make sure that I have a module in the case that will um, not only play back samples, um, but also record samples. I have uh, quite a few actually uh, modules in here for sample playback. In fact, uh, the Rample was my first module for sample playback. Um, it allows us to play back uh, either four mono samples or two uh, stereo samples, very handy. Um, sample playback one here, the Squarp Rample. And then I've also got a bunch of these Tip Top Audio 1 uh, sample modules here. And these allow us to play back uh, whatever samples I load into these little memory cards here. But those modules uh, don't actually sample um, directly into them. Next, I have this big module over here, the Assimilator. And this is a dedicated uh, multi-timbral uh, sample module which absolutely allows us to sample into it and I could have you know taken any one of these notes we could have sampled or a combination of notes or the chord itself you know we can um, feed them into the inputs here and we uh, has a very very high rate of uh, sample it's like um, oh my goodness I can't remember off the top of my head all of a sudden it's like way higher than you would expect like um, it's like hundred and ninety two kilohertz or hundred and ninety six kilohertz or something like that um, that it records in and that allows us to detune um, the samples like quite a bit and still retain a very high quality. So absolutely, um, we could have done some really intense sampling and recreation and done all sorts of stuff that way. Um, but specifically, um, you know, today was about, you know, using the module this way, uh, not only so I can share this technique with you guys, but also so that I sort of have it, um, you know, filmed that I could go back to you in case I ever forget uh, how to do this. I just kind of came up with this uh, technique this week after seeing um, a post on Facebook that Qubit had made about um, a, a way that they're creatively using uh, their module. 
I didn't have all of the modules uh, that they showed in that example, so it got me thinking, you know, of how could I use it more creatively in my system. Uh, for the most part, I've just been taking the mix out of this module and not the individual notes from that chord um, at the same time. So it does take up, you know, a full, you know, four VCA module to do this. Um, but another thing we could do, speaking of sampling as well, is if we wanted to get really creative and you know keep the chord module open to be used we could um, absolutely have just started uh, programming uh, the setup for the arpeggio maybe not run any filters or any reverb and then maybe just sample a good you know eight or sixteen bars of this arpeggio playing we could have just sampled that into the sampler as a loop as well and then we could have just played that back from the sampler as a loop as well I mean it's still evolving even though that evolution Evolution of notes is going to repeat every 8 or 16 bars. Um, there's lots of different ways to approach all of these things. And I think that's really actually one of the beauties of modular is like taking a concept that you've seen somewhere else or learned from someone else and then seeing, you know, how can I apply that directly to my system? Because like I mentioned earlier, you know, I don't expect anyone to have this exact same system that I've got and, you know, no one's going to pick out the the exact same modules. I have just like a hundred modules here, you know what I mean? Um, but for instance, you know, I have several filters, and whereas those filters might not be the same filters as other Eurorack users have, they're definitely going to have filters of some kind in their system. While someone might not have the same VCAs and the same envelope generators that I have, they're definitely going to have some VCAs and some envelope generators in their system. So these techniques can really really be applicable um, to more than just, you know, one particular setup with, you know, those exact same modules. Um, and I really hope that that's clear as we, you know, build these sort of things. Bring that art back up and that reverb back up. All right, we've been going for almost two hours today. I think we're going to call it pretty soon because we've, you know, explored this technique pretty well. So if anyone has any questions at all, whether they be, you know, related to what we did today or just music production related in general, now would be a great time to ask those as well. And I'll do the best I can to answer any questions that come up. take what we've done here and like start speeding the tempo up right here we're up to like a hundred and sixty beats per minute you can see that the arpeggio has got quite a bit of a different vibe now if we could bring this reverb down on the arpeggio sound but leave the reverb up really heavy on the big chord coming over the top here. So you hear how the groove is just kind of evolving a little bit? about whatever we want once we've created that sort of a, you know, bass melody to work with. If you start speeding it up, you know, obviously the drums I had in this box weren't really, you know, meant for this kind of a beat. But you get the idea, right? Tuck that bass down in the mix a little more. Tucking the bass back a little. And we'll just listen to this for a minute. You hear those notes in the arpeggio change? 
every eight bars. Um, <laughs> the thing about the specific questions, Douglas, is this is really the this is really the place. I'm really busy. Is the thing um, like all day, every day, and I don't necessarily um, have the time to dedicate individually um, to to everyone who would who would maybe like it. Um, I don't mean that to sound rude, and I apologize if it does. Um, but I can definitely do my best to answer a few questions uh, on these streams, you know, so please feel free to ask. Oh, I really appreciate that, Slim Pickens. Thank you. While I don't have a full modular system, I love that your explanations apply to my semi-modular gear. That's awesome to hear. And thank you guys for the chat uh, as well. Thank you. All right. Just want to sh uh, state again, uh, for those of you who might have missed me talking about it earlier, that um, I've added a channel membership uh, to this channel. For those of you who might be interested in supporting the channel, um, maybe who aren't into Patreon or whatnot, I'm not offering a whole bunch of like um, extras and freebies on the YouTube membership, uh, but it's just a great way uh, to support the channel if you've been getting you know a lot of value out of my streams and out of my videos, and if you're looking for a way uh, to support the channel. Um, the freebies and the bonuses are over on Patreon. So for as little as one dollar a month, you know you can get access to some extra freebie downloads as well and help support the channel that way. I'm just trying to create that membership uh, to give yet another way uh, for people to support the channel who maybe aren't into you know uh, Patreon and whatnot. Sorry for the background hums here, guys. Um, we'll just play the groove a little bit longer, I think, and um, maybe. Bring it down a little in tempo. You can really create quite a different, you know, grooves. Quite a, a different, uh, quite a wide variety of different grooves using this same technique and just kind of changing the tempo, changing how you're approaching the beat, maybe. And we could slow this down even further again and drop a four on the floor like we had before, etc., etc. Hey, thanks very much, Subachu. I appreciate that. With the model samples, cool deal. Actually, you guys, um, I'm really hoping to do, um, let's see if I can figure out where this hum is coming from this time. I'm really hoping to do um, a lot more live streams. Um, I guess this is as good a time as any to let you know that I've actually uh, just yesterday um, ordered a new Mac laptop. I've ordered another audio interface and uh, some cables to connect all that stuff up. And I'm hoping to use that as like my main streaming computer. And I'm hoping to do more live streams longer live streams and more in-depth live streams. I really want to get in um, to um, showing a little bit of Ableton on this channel and I haven't uh, really uh, really had that set up yet and this new setup is going to allow me um, to send the Ableton screen over to the streaming computer as well. So we're going to be getting into um, just lots and lots of hybrid and fun, detailed, really geeky building sessions where I'm going to show you guys all sorts of stuff about how to um, connect up Ableton Live with your Euro racks using this new uh, module that I've uh, been exploring. Uh, this is the ha a circuit. I keep trying to say happy circuits, but it's not. It's circuit happy. It's the circuit happy ML2. And basically, it creates it's a little tiny module that creates its own Wi Fi network um, and allows me to sync up a, uh, a Ableton link wirelessly um, and, you know, then utilize the power of Ableton alongside the power of the Eurorack. And that's really what I'm about. I'm the hybrid guy, you guys. I want to, you know, be able to use the Euro rack with other hardware. I want to be able to use the Euro rack with Ableton. I want to be able to use Ableton with my hardware. I mean, I just like to do it all. I want to bring the iPad into this to where we can have my rack uh, going on the side. I want to do lots of different 
um, types of teaching to lots of different kinds of people who are in different you know stages of their musical journey everything um, from more beginner friendly um, you know live streams to like the most hardcore technical stuff that I you know do in here um, so there's going to be a lot more live streams coming um, and just, you know, a lot more content overall. So I don't see any reason why not. Well, I will definitely be getting some more uh, model samples into that mix as well. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, actually, I got the uh, uh, the uh, Intel Mac laptops uh, from... Uh, it's the um, Mac uh, MacBook Pro, like 16 inch. Um, it's a pretty eh, ridiculously expensive investment, but I really need to be able to take that streaming to the next level uh, and be able to show Ableton uh, inside the screen, whether not just like a camera pointed at it, you know. Um, but I did some research on the new um, M1 Mac laptops uh, right off the jump because the price was a lot better than the MacBook Pro. Um, but as soon as you do um, some serious investigating on those, uh, using those to stream with, using OBS, Open Broadcaster System, or whatever it is that we're using to stream with, um, apparently those Mac uh, books with the M1 chip, the new ones that they're really stoked on and that everybody is stoked on, apparently they're great and they work really well except for streaming. Apparently the processor gets really warm really fast when streaming there's no fan in those it's just the M1 processor that's kind of one of the things people are excited about no fan it's quieter and you know lighter and less materials inside and all that but it also can't cool down that chip so when the chip gets hot it throttles the system and chokes the amount of frames that you can send out um, via OBS so uh, using one of the new M1 chip MacBook laptops for live streaming is apparently less than optimal. Um, and that's what a few days of extra research helped me find out uh, this week. So I didn't get an M1 Mac. I got uh, one of the older um, with the Intel in it. Um, I'm really hoping that this is, you know, going to be easy enough that I can actually set up. I'm a really big on the you know on the gear um, technology. I'm not super slick on all of this new school um, streaming technology. So it's just more stuff I have to learn you know. Um, but yeah more streams, new laptop. We're going to be showing inside of Ableton. We're going to be uh, working with Ableton and the gear. Um, not just the Euro rack, but we're going to be like literally um, doing stuff like how to build a live jam inside of Ableton and assign your MIDI controllers. And you know, I have a lot of friends um, who are Ableton only with no gear. And you know, they come to me and say, Oh, I can't perform live. I only have Ableton. Well, I mean, that doesn't really make sense though because it's called Ableton Live. And you can act absolutely do a ton of stuff with it live even if you just have like one MIDI controller and I'm going to be showing uh, that kind of stuff and just we're going to go go deep and sometimes we're not going to go deep but sometimes we're going to go really deep um, and do lots of exploring um, and combining of the gear uh, in new and exciting ways hopefully um, oh I'm I'm good I appreciate that that Douglas um, but I've got um, I've got my system all organized right now, and I'm definitely not looking uh, to check out like different software at this time. Maybe as as, as I keep doing this and keep getting um, a little bit more comfortable, um, you know, with it. But uh, this the live streaming of all of this and the cameras and all that is definitely a whole new uh, level of, you know, because um, with video editing I can always just take the shot again, you know. But here we are doing it live, and I've got to remember the tech stuff on top of all of that. Uh, so I'm just kind of sticking with what I know um, at this time. Um, cool. Yeah, people do like that, you know, the the um, the the M1 MacBooks. But if you're trying to use it with OBS specifically, is where um, people have been running into that that problem where the chip heats up and it chokes the frame rate that OBS spits out. And I just can't have that. I need it to be uh, super reliable, especially with you know the amount I'm reinvesting yet again to step up the channel. Um, okay, cool deal. So that's what we were able to create today using this random sort of melodics technique. Uh, you know, a specific 
specifically using the qubit chord module today, but definitely something you could recreate using multiple oscillators if you don't have um, an oscillator like this that puts out uh, a chord specifically. I really want to try to um, to recreate this technique inside of my rack as well. Um, there's just never enough hours in the day. I really want to get back uh, to putting out some more my rack content for those of you uh, who might be really interested in Euro rack, but don't uh, you know necessarily have the real world stuff because you can really do so much with my rack. Um, again, we're going to be doing um, stuff with the Euro rack and with my rack um, together as well, like synced up side by side. I've got a lot of ideas and plans uh, for future streams if all goes according to plan. Um, okay, so here's again what we put together today, this sort of melodic element. Again, the drums are kind of irrelevant today. It was more the melodic that we're, you know, really concerned about how, how we go about creating this kind of thing. And that even though the voicing of the chord is changing, and the notes in the arpeggio are changing, they still gel over the bass line. Because we're not changing, you know, what chord we're playing. We're not changing the notes, the root, you know. We're just changing the voicing. That arp out. Mess with that bass sound. Filter the arp back in. Break on the drums in one. <clears throat> Just like that, you know, we've got something that we can kind of jam around with. We could add more arpeggios to this. We could add more chord stabs to this. We're using samples, or we could, you know, do as some uh, as a viewer, you know, suggested earlier. We could even sample what we've created and then, you know, reuse the chords module for something else in this same patch. That little bit of movement and evolution in the melodics here over the bass line and drums is really what's key because we're not changing it and it just sort of evolves now. This sort of uh, melodic technique I think is really useful over like a, a four on the floor type of groove even though we're using kind of a different sort of a groove here. Let's try that. Maybe a little bit too fast for this arp. We've got to groove properly, so we probably slow it down. Here's 121 beats per minute, kind of a chilled, housey, dubby kind of a vibe now. We could add some shakers to this, or any number of extra percussion elements. You know, some white noise hi hats we were going to continue programming out the patch, you know? Bring those.
goes down a bit. We've got a question here from Slim. Can you talk real quick about what your sound design career means? Go to a studio during business hours, all remote, hired by... No, I mean, um, I've been making sound uh, banks and sample packs and uh, whatnot since 1994. Um, I've made over 200 uh, sample packs and sound banks uh, in that amount of time. Um, I make you know, sound banks uh, for hardware in here. Like I've currently got seven uh, sound banks that I'm selling for the Electron Digitact. I've got nine uh, sound banks that I'm selling for the Electron Model Samples. Uh, I'm working super hard um, for about almost a year now on an ultimate inspiration uh, sound bank for the PolyInd Tracker uh, hardware box. Um, I did a, uh, a complete um, refill expansion pack for the um, Electribe, which camera am I on there? For the Electribe um, ESX1 here, where um, my refill takes uh, all of the factory sounds, and this is a, this is a sample based box. It deletes all of the samples and uh, fills them up with all new sounds that I've created by hand from scratch, like some 200, 300 sounds, and then you know brings another um, 64 new patterns to that. So there's sound banks for the Electron Digitact, uh, model samples for the Electribe ESX-1. I did uh, a refill bank as well uh, for the Electribe uh, uh, 2, where it takes all of the factory sounds out, puts all new sounds in that I've created from scratch, and you get 100 new patterns. Um, so that's what I mean by being a sound designer. Uh, through, elect through my business, Electrona Sounds, I've been making, um, you know, sound banks and sound packs and, you know, refills. Um, I've done some work for third-party companies uh, over the years. I've worked with Native Instruments. Um, I did um, one of my favorite and most proud of projects that I've done over the years is I did um, the Psy expansion bank for the virtual synthesizer from Vengeance. Um, uh, oh, I'm running a blank all of a sudden. Uh, uh, the one the license keeps running out of on the desktop um the um Oh, my for Avenger, Vengeance Avenger, excuse me. Um, I did uh, the Psy um, Sound Bank refill for that, where I designed, um, it was their largest uh, sound bank to date. Um, I really wanted to do something special uh, for the Psy community at that time. This was some years ago, uh, four or five years ago. Um, I felt that, you know, of the virtual synthesizers that were coming out at that time, just not enough um, love for like the Psy um, psychedelic trance, you know. Um, um, uh, sound uh, for those so I spent like literally like 18 hours a day for two months creating um, like the what I could do at that time like the be all end all um, sound bank for trance uh, for psi trance excuse me psychedelic trance um, yeah, so like anybody who's using, um, you know, that sound bank is using my sounds. I've done sound banks for Serum. I've done sound banks for vir uh, virtual synthesizers like Silent and Dune 2. Um, so everything from programming synthesizers and making sound banks to, you know, creating samples and sounds uh, from scratch and then using those to build my own banks inside of, you know, hardware boxes in addition to just selling um, actual, you know, sample packs on my website uh, through other companies. Um, Native Instruments uh, have a lot of my sounds uh, through um, their distribution um, website, which is sounds.com. I've got a lot of samples um, up there. Actually, theirs are like um, individually browsable, so you can like, you know, grab a whole pack of sounds or just one or two sounds for your project. Um, yeah, I've been at this for a really, really long time, uh, since about 1994. Um, so that's what I mean about my, my sound design career. I hope that answers your question. Um, whoops, right, I've got this plugged in now. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any, um, any intention at this point to doing any packs for the MC707, um, but you never know. I mean, I also have the Akai boxes, which are sample-based boxes, but I don't really have any intention at this time of doing, um, refills for those boxes either. There's long stories kind of behind a lot of those decisions, um, yeah, probably not going to get into on the live stream, um, 
but yeah, it just sort of depends. It just sort of depends. I'm thinking, I'm currently thinking actually about doing another refill um, for the red Electribe because um, I just was able to fix mine on the, you know last week's live stream and it's working really well again. Um, and people really seem to enjoy um, the refill that I did uh, put together for that uh, machine. You know, it's a really old machine, so if you still have just the factory patterns and the factory sounds and that, you know, it's pretty dated, not super usable. Um, but mine, uh, you know, refills for these boxes, but, you know, newer, more modern sounds and maybe a little bit more modern grooves, albeit, you know, I'm still kind of a 90s guy too, but um, definitely more sounds, you know, than were in there. Um, yeah, live needs to be simple, less likely to go wrong. Exactly. Over the years and doing, you know, live streams uh, that I've started now on this channel and all these videos that I put out, so many things can go wrong when you're trying to do, um, you know, live performances. I've learned a lot about how to just kind of let things go and just kind of go with it um, when the mistakes happen, when it's live, you know. Um, definitely practice helps there more than anything else, I think, really. Um, Okay, so let's just take one more um, listen to the groove that we created today. I'm going to let you guys uh, say goodbye to each other in the chat. I really appreciate uh, everyone hanging out with me on another one of these Sunday live streams. And uh, we're definitely going to be back next Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time for another live stream. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to be doing yet. Um, hopefully it'll be something fun. So here's just the drums and our bass. Again, the drums were just irrelevant just to have a little bit of rhythm today so we could spend more time focusing on the technique than on, you know, programming drum sounds. We're going to bring in the sort of arpeggio here now and bring up the reverb on that chord. I've got our core just doused in reverb so that we have that huge wash over the top of it. But we could easily just turn that down if we didn't want that sort of a vibe, you know? Make it a lot more focused on the arpeggio rather than on the chord wash. And you hear how those notes change, but we're still in key. So awesome. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, Douglas, but what I'm trying to get across is that, and I really don't mean to be rude, but I have a lot of people who would like to just kind of chat about their technical stuff with me in real time, and I just, there's too many people who would like that kind of time and attention from me and I, I don't have the hours in the day to devote to like individual um, you know one-on-one -on -one tech and hangout conversations with people um, but I'm trying to make myself available to answer questions on these live streams that you know aren't related to the stream so you can feel free to ask you know stuff here and I'll do my best to answer that also it gives other people a chance you know to learn from that information um, if I'm just, you know, giving you answers, then nobody else is learning at the same time. And if I answer questions on these streams, other people get to learn from them as well. Oh, no worries. Slim is using the MC7 as the central brain of his setup. I think that's a great use for the MC707. Absolutely. It's a really, really powerful box. I think even if it was the only thing in your setup, you'd still be pretty unstoppable. You know what I mean? I really like what the MC707 can bring to the table. I know I'm pointing at the TR8S like it's the MC707. It's just because I've got them both. And so in my mind, they're kind of the same box. You know what I mean? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
yeah, I really like how this just keeps evolving, that melodic. You know, if I was going to extend this, we would definitely get, like, another melodic layer uh, happening in here, as well as, like, some more percussion, and get some change-ups going. But I think this is a really cool and fun way to get uh, Groove started. And it just kind of jams away on its own, you know? Giving you the ability to worry about other stuff, like the drums here. You know, because we don't have to worry about moving the filter on the chords or anything. Yeah, they're both magic, I think. The TR-8S and the MC-707. Super useful that we've just got, you know, faders on all of the sounds, kind of as a built-in part of the workflow. Because it's absolutely amazing for live jamming in that respect, you know? that arpeggio all the way out. And then we can just chill with that chord wash and the bass line, giving you, you know, as a musician, the opportunity to maybe focus on messing with other stuff like the bass line. Maybe drop the drums, right, as you're messing with that bass, create that little bit of a break. Bring it back. Here I've got the bass filtered all the way out. We can now filter the arpeggio back in. Now we can slowly filter the bass back in. Probably can't hear that if you're on your phone speaker. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah, the MC-707 I think is definitely suitable as a hub. Like the MC-707 or the Force. Either or, I think would both make really nice, like central brains. Absolutely. Yeah, Michael knows, absolutely. It's a pretty good hardware only clip launcher. It can control itself as well as many external sense. You really can't go wrong. And you've got the sound quality. I really can't stress this enough, you know, because. I have both the Force and the MC-707, and I really think um, that they're, you know, somewhat comparable um, in that, you know, you can really do a lot with just that box alone. But if I have to compare them side by side, um, the, uh, the MC-707 and the Roland quality sounds is going to win out sound quality-wise over the Force like 10 out of 10 times. The Roland sounds that you get that are just, even if you're not into sound design at all, if you just like lush, rich th uh, synthesizer sounds and you want to have tons and tons and tons of sounds that are awesome and high quality to play with, the MC-707, like I think hands down, like over the force in that respect. But then again, if you really just want to work with samples and produce and produce and really get in there with the mixing and the fine tuning, I think the force really shines there. So yeah, it's kind of they're they're both. So my, I guess my point would be that they're both really awesome and robust boxes that could be used, you know, as like the master brain in your system. Absolutely, absolutely, either or. Um. 
Okay, so I know I said we were going to call it like 20 minutes ago, and we just kind of been hanging out. I just want to give plenty of time, you know, to answer questions on these streams, if there is questions. Um, and so I think we're going to go ahead and call it. Um, and I really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in with me this week. Uh, thanks for your patience with me kind of struggling with the live chat. I'm sorry I didn't have it uh, up super easy to read. It's just not coming through for some reason um, on, o on, uh, on the YouTube uh, app here like it normally just shows on the screen, but it doesn't today, you know. Uh, just another anomaly to kind of get around. So I appreciate everyone's patience. And until next time, thanks for watching.